Hi everyone, welcome to our event. Uh, so this is a workshop and in this workshop we will see how to use DVC, how to use GitOps practices for converting Jupyter Notebooks to pipelines. And um, yeah, I don't know if I need to say anything else in addition to that. So during the workshop, if you have any questions, please use live chat. So I will be monitoring this uh, your questions I will be monitoring the live chat and in case I see something that is relevant to what uh, Rob is showing I will just interrupt him and ask the question so that's roughly it I think um, now the floor is yours please start. Sounds good. thanks um, yeah so thanks for having me of course and uh, thanks everyone for uh, joining for the session uh, today I'll be talking about GitOps for ML uh, so going from a notebook to a reproducible pipeline as you've probably read in the description and uh, we'll be doing so using DVC, which is an open source uh, uh, library. Uh, stands for data version control, but as we'll see shortly, it, it does a lot more than that as well. Um, yeah, so I think without further ado, let's just dive right into it. I'll first give a, a short introduction to DVC and why um, it's useful in certain sounds like these. Uh, then we'll go through the workshop together. So I hope you've got your terminal and your ID all set up um, so that you can follow along. Um, uh, the first part of the workshop will entail uh, converting the notebook to a DVC pipeline. And then if we've got any time left, we'll uh, take a look at how we can take the model training uh, for our new pipeline online with CML, uh, which is CICD for machine. But more on that later. Um, so uh, for me, when I start prototyping in a notebook, uh, or sorry, when I start prototyping a machine learning uh, uh, project, I usually start out in a notebook. Um, it's easy to set up, start on the fly, uh, be able to go back and forth, change a few parameters here and there. Uh, but inevitably, um, the notebook grows too big. It becomes a bit uncontrollable. My kernel keeps dying. I was actually experiencing that earlier today while preparing this workshop. Um, so that's where DVC comes in. Uh, first about me, um, just a very short intro. Uh, I'm from Utrecht in the Netherlands. Uh, up until recently, I was working as developer advocate for Iterative. Um, and as will come in later, I'm a water Pokemon trainer. Um, we'll be using a notebook uh, that creates a classifier for uh, Pokemon sprites. Um, so yeah, let's see. This is what your typical uh, notebook may look like. Uh, let's see if this starts. Oh, sorry, that's not working. Um, the video didn't get converted properly. I but... see something, like I see a Jupyter notebook. Yeah, I don't think it's moving though. Uh, there should be a video. Um, oh. Yeah, no worries. Um, your typical notebook, you've seen this a thousand times before. Uh, first you do your imports, uh, then you probably do some data in, uh, cleaning preparation. Uh, from there on out, maybe your model training and then some evaluation of the model uh, to start some metrics. Uh, sorry, to, to find your metrics, maybe a confusion matrix, whatever you're optimizing for. Um, and this works quite well, uh, as long as you are going all the way from the top, all the way to the bottom, and you don't get that kernel somewhere in between. Um, but at the point where you do get to the, um, the fully working prototype, um, you, you still can't quite start using the model. Um, we have our model at this point. Uh, we can classify whether a Pokemon is of a water type, um, but then something happens, uh, something in the real world that affects how your model performs. So for example, in this uh, Pokemon classifier, uh, two new Pokemon games got released last November. I haven't played them thus far, um, but that changes uh, the composition of our data set. Uh, and this is something you'll see time and time again uh, in uh, whatever machine learning context you may be working on. Something changed in the real world, that it results in new data sets. You may introduce some drift. Um, the model has a changed performance and it may need retraining. Um, so even though we had a working prototype in our notebook, uh, something happened and now we need to change the prototype. So in machine learning, we've got a process for this um, and that would be experimentation. Um, so we tweak some parameters on the fly. Uh, so here we change our data set maybe, we uh, can take a look at the number of epochs. Um, we can change some weights, some other stuff. Uh, we may be interested in uh, training for a new model, uh, sorry, for a new Pokemon type. Uh, so maybe in the latest Pokemon release, I wanna be a fire type trainer. Um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you've seen all the hyperparameters yourself. Um, but 
as you do this uh, and you try to keep track of those those uh, experiments you're running, um, you can get lost in which experiments you had run. Uh, so, for example, oh, I, I trained this model for uh, classifying fire type Pokemon, uh, but what were the precise combination of learning rate and the number of epochs for that? And how does it compare to the other one? Uh, so we need a structured approach towards this experimentation. Um, and that's so that we can re uh, uh, achieve reproducibility of our experiments. So if I do one thing uh, at a certain time and I do the same thing at another point in time, then I should get the same results. Um, otherwise, there, there's randomness. We can't reproduce our machine learning uh, experiments. We don't know which experiments perform best. So what do we need to achieve that reproducibility? Uh, if we want to reproduce an experiment, we want, need to be able to reproduce our data, our code, and our parameters. Uh, so the data sets, uh, uh, that's the one that changed in, in this specific example. Uh, the code is something that we can reproduce. Uh, that's been a solved problem for a long time. We use Git for that. Uh, and the parameters are also largely text files. Um, so we can also use Git for that. But the data set uh, is the tricky part. And also the resulting models, because those files are cheap. So if we've got Git for text-based files, uh, then what can we use for the large files? And that's where DVC comes in. Originally started out as data version control. Uh, what it does is it ties your um, uh, the versioning of your, your files, uh, your data sets, your models, to your Git commit history. Um, and it's got three main features, uh, which we'll briefly discuss. So first of all, data version control, then pipelines, and then experiments. Um, and yeah, it, it helps to understand how the data version control works before we dive straight into pipelines and experiments. So data version control first. Um, imagine you have a Git repository. Uh, so these are our commits going up. Uh, we've got a feature branch. Uh, and in the feature branch, we have a data set. Uh, so here we have three Pokemon in that data set. Um, and that works well enough, except when the image files are quite large, uh, because uh, I think GitHub has a 50 MB uh, limit to the files you can upload, uh, roughly similar for GitLab. Uh, Git isn't meant to store large files. Um, so what can we do with DVC? Um, we replace those image files or our data set with a metadata file. Uh, and the metadata file includes some metadata, uh, such as the has, the size of the data sets, and the number of files there. And we place that metadata file in our Git commit history. Um, we then use that uh, metadata file to point towards um, something in our DFC cache. Uh, so the DFC cache is something that DFC creates. Um, what it does with the, it, it structures the image files in there in a certain manner so that DVC can retrieve those image files uh, or any other files that you may have um, as, as you need them. Uh, so for example, here we have a data set of DVC and it points towards uh, this point in the DVC cache and DVC knows how to or can resolve that to the proper image files. Um, and this is called Reflink. So the funny thing about this, or the, the uh, nice thing about this, is that once we get a new Git commit um, with an updated data set of DVC, it can point towards some other stuff in your DVC cache. So here, for example, we removed the bottom Pokemon from our data set, uh, which is Omastar, I believe, and we added uh, Charizard uh, to our data set. And the other two uh, Pokemon here, um, those are uh, still only once in our DVC cache. So we don't need to duplicate our data, uh, even if we have incremental changes to our data set. Uh, and then, of course, we can mirror that to a remote storage, um, as we'll also do throughout the workshop. Uh, so that DVC doesn't uh, only live on your local system, but uh, you also have to version, much like you would version, or you would mirror your Git repository to GitLab or GitHub or Bitbucket or uh, self-hosted solution. Um, so that's in, uh, yeah, that's in, uh, in a really short uh, description how DVC roughly works. Now let's take a look at pipelines, uh, because we can use the way DVC versions your uh, data files uh, in pipelines. So this is um, roughly the same as we saw in the notebook, or I described for the notebook. We first do some data pre-processing, we then load in the data, uh, we train it, we train our model, uh, and when, then we evaluate it to see how the model performs. 
Um, and for those of you who may be aware, this can be uh, described as a DAG. Um, so we start at one point and the subsequent stages only trigger as uh, the previous stage is complete. All of these stages uh, result in a number of outputs. So for example, for the model training stage, uh, we have a model as a result and also a bunch of plots uh, that show how our model training went. Um, I see a question about the difference between MLflow and DFC. I'll keep that for a little bit later if that's okay. Um, then the outputs of a previous stage are the inputs for a next stage, or we can at least tell DFC that, hey, only start data load uh, once the data set labels and data set images um, are created in DFC cache. And so, um, by means of that, DVC knows how to, or at what point to start the next stage. And we can assure that um, they all get processed uh, uh, in a subsequent manner. Uh, so if we have that pipeline in place, uh, and we know that all of the stages uh, follow up on each other, and we can always reproduce the same uh, pipeline results, we can start a pyramid. So we have a num number of inputs and we have a number of outputs, and our DVC pipeline somewhere in the middle. Um, so our inputs are the stuff we needed to reproduce the experiments, the code, the data, and the parameters. Um, and we do something with those in the pipeline, and it results in a bunch of outputs, the model, the plots, and the metrics in this case. All of these are versioned by uh, either Git or DFC. Uh, so roughly speaking, uh, if it's a text file, you version it with Git. If it's not, then you version it with DFC, um, just to keep the the file, uh, the file size small. Um, and if we take all of this together, um, we can consider this an experiment, or uh, technically speaking, we can consider it a git commit. Um, all of these together, uh, we can then go back to a different git commit, reproduce those results. So we jump back and forth, as you can see here. Um, so for the previous experiments, we had a bunch of different parameters that resulted in different outputs. So because the parameters change, our model plots and metrics also change. And with just a single command or um, two, uh, depending on how you set it up, uh, get checkout and DFC checkout, you can easily switch back and forth between those. So no longer you need to keep track of your experiments on sticky notes um, to determine which uh, combination of the three inputs resulted in a given model performance. Um, that's the high over of what Git and DVC together can accomplish. And I think we'll spend the remainder of this workshop uh, setting um, or, or taking a Jupyter notebook and transforming it into a DVC pipeline. Um, so if you want to follow along, I think it'll be great fun and you can experience for yourself what this process looks like. Uh, please to go to this URL, uh, which was also posted in the chat. Um, it's there in the description. So yeah, just go okay. below the video. There are links, uh, and the first one says repository, uh, and the link is there. Just click on yeah. this link. Perfect. Um, so then, to get back to the question, what's the difference between MLflow and DFC? Um, they share some similarities. To answer for DFC, it's an open source library that does your data versioning. Uh, it's not a hosted platform. Um, so I think the main benefit is that you uh, can use it uh, free and use it in any way you like. Um, so yeah, just give it a go and see what it does. MLflow does some other stuff. Uh, DFC fits into the iterative ecosystem um, that also offers a more complete uh, package uh, for your uh, machine learning development process uh, or your MLOps process, I should say. Um, but maybe you're only interested in just doing the data versioning or just doing the pipelines and then you only need DFC. And then once you're interested in also doing model training online um, or creating a model registry, uh, you can look towards other products such as um, CML or Iterator Studio. Um, so it's a little bit more modular. Uh, and also it's, it's yeah not um, vendor locked, so uh, you can use it with whatever stack you may have. Uh, let's see another question I saw that seems useful when you have data on premise, but can we use the version data host elsewhere on the cloud, for example? Um, so the data um, 
is in, in this case stored locally. Uh, you can mirror it to a, uh, to a cloud storage, for example, an S3 bucket. Uh, and if that's also currently working or more export, uh, a more advanced product, um, uh, G, uh, yeah, uh, DQL. Um, I think, yeah, uh, Dimitri, the CEO, emailed about this, I think, a week or two ago. Uh, sign up to the newsletter if you want to learn more about that. Um, and let's see, yeah, which looks like at least one duplication of primary data will always happen. Ha yeah, um, yes, that's true. Um, so if you pull the data to your uh, local system, then you are duplicating the data. Uh, and uh, similarly, if you push it to your remote, then you are duplicating the data there. All right. So um, just uh, for those who watch it in uh, replay, uh, there will be no access to live chat. So the question that you just answered was about, like, if there is, a, if you store the data in S3 and you do DVC pool, you don't load the data. So the data is kind of duplicated. So it's stored once in S3 and once on your local machine, right? That was yeah. the question, and this is what you answered, right? Yes. Okay. Thanks for uh, for the recap. Um, all right. So let's dive into the workshop. Um, Okay, can you so make I'll, it larger a bit? It's hard to yes. see the text. Thank you. I already had the uh, had to scale down my monitor uh, because otherwise, uh, <laughs> but ultrawide doesn't play nicely with uh, with uh, Zoom streaming. Um, I hope um, it's clear to follow as it is. Zoom a little bit further. Um, yeah. So if you want to follow along, um, the link is in the description. Uh, clone the Git repo. Um, Oh, this is a bit of an annoyance, but we can figure this out. Um, so we go to uh, documents. Um, and I think I already cloned it. Um, yes, DC workshop. So I don't need to do that part. Um, and then we can open it here. File open recent uh, documents DC workshop. And here we've got the um, um, the exact same as we we see online. Maybe you can make um, this larger too. A bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, is that good enough? Oh well, I mean, if you can, can go a little one more bit time. Larger. Yeah, that's yeah. that's better. It's not my favorite development experience, but uh, we'll <laughs> make it work. Um, let's go to a few of these so we don't get any notifications popping up. <laughs> and then let's dive into it. Um, so the first thing we need to do when we uh, start a new project, um, it's just a good practice is create a virtual environment for our uh, dependencies. Um, and all of these steps are of course listed in the uh, readme, um, as you can see here. Uh, so uh, it's probably easiest to just copy the, um, the instructions if, uh, if you want to follow along. A um, few notes, uh, you need Python and virtual env is, uh, uh, should also be installed. Um, and I think the it's a little bit lower, uh, the notes on hardware. Actually, I'll just show it here because it's better formatted. Um, so I'm working on a MacBook. Uh, so in my requirements, I'm using TensorFlow macOS and TensorFlow Metal. Uh, if you are not using a MacBook, I can't speak for a very uh, precise setup, um, but generally you will need TensorFlow. Uh, so make sure to replace that in uh, the requirements.txt. So we remove only, because there is TensorFlow macOS and TensorFlow Metal, so we replace TensorFlow Metal with TensorFlow macOS with TensorFlow and remove TensorFlow Metal, right? Yeah, correct. Um, Actually, I'll it's the same as it now. Um, right. So where were we? We were creating the virtual environment. Um, and here my uh, ID automatically detects that I have created a virtual environment. Um, we'll switch to it automatically. Uh, and we do that through source then activate. Uh, and now, as you can see here, we are working on a virtual environment and we can start installing our um, 
requirements.txt. And here Pip will automatically download the packages. Let's see if there are any further questions thus far. Uh, can you please make it in light mode? Um, ooh, I honestly don't know if I can do that. Appearance. I'll need to Google how to achieve that. Um, yes, go to light mode. And there is also an option to reverse the colors on the other end. Right, so maybe you can find uh, like there are programs like tools for Windows where you can just reverse the colors and then your light dark mode becomes light. I mean that's more like a comment from for Moonies. Okay, uh, I'll give it a quick go. Open uh, file preferences. I think preferences generally here settings. Oh, theme, there we go. Uh, color theme. Hmm. Sorry, I don't think I've got a light theme installed. Uh, but there is another question that could be um, important. Is uh, I also noticed that in your case, you have TensorFlow 2.11.0, and in my case, I have 2.9. Nine. Oh, right, yeah. So that's requirements um, and requirements runner. There's, these are different things. Uh, yeah, don't worry about the requirements uh, runner thus far. The, okay. I had some errors with the TensorFlow Mac OS. This was what worked uh, as I was working through it. Um, there was a, a bit of a strange bug that I couldn't find. Like the, the solution I found online was, oh, you need to downgrade to this version until they fix it. Uh, but it did this about two weeks ago. So I'm not quite sure what the status about this. Um, from what yeah, I've tested, the spin yeah. versions here work well. And then, yeah, coming back to this comment from Francisco. So I am also on Windows and I'm following this tutorial. So what I did is, uh, yeah, I just replaced the TensorFlow Mac OS with TensorFlow and removed the metal thing. And it is still installing. Uh, yeah, it's very Okay. Uh, I hope this, uh, this is better for uh, everyone. Uh, with troubles uh, seeing the previous version. Okay, um, so let's see where were we? We were installing um, the... Yeah, so as you can see here, we uh, installed our packages. Um, and from there on out, we can continue. Uh, and we need to download the data. Uh, so if you are following along, um, there are two data sets on Kaggle and you need to download those. I already did that. Um, they're quite small data sets, by the way. So um, these two, and we create a new folder and we're placing them with data external. Let's see. And now we've got our Pokemon images here on which we'll be training uh, the model. Uh, and this is our uh, label data set, or at least uh, it is, but we haven't processed it uh, to look nice. Uh, so from here on out, we should be able to um, take a look at the notebook. Uh, and we're going to Pokemon classifier. Um, so this notebook, as you can also run it uh, uh, online, I found this crashes a little bit less. Um, so Let's take a look. Um, first, we do our imports. This is the moment of truth. Let's see how many errors we get along the way. Um, we define some global variables. Uh, so for example, we are training for water type Pokemon. Um, if anyone wants to wager a guess in the comments why we're going for water type Pokemon, you're happy to do so right now. It's a bit of a silly reasoning. Might be busy. Be, people might be busy uh, downloading data and unpacking it. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, right. I think so. No, it's uh, it's class imbalance. Um, the um, 
most the, the largest class in Pokemon uh, are water Pokemon. Um, so we're training a completely nonsense model. We're also validating on our training sets. So the results don't really make sense from a data science point of view, uh, but this is at least getting close to a reasonable result. Um, so from there on out, we just run through all the cells um, one by one. Uh, so this utility to such project routes, uh, we create some directories we may need. Uh, and this is where it actually starts. So this is the data pre-processing. I won't go through all of these two in depth because um, it's not actually that important to have the, um, to understand the, the contents of the cells before we start replacing them later on. Uh, output exceeds size limits. Oh, that's fun. Uh, did I not name this properly? All oh, right. Uh, so in the external, I didn't follow my instructions. This should be in the stats directory. Uh, so let's try that again. And as you can see, now we get our data set. Uh, so Pokedex number, uh, the Pokemon, which types they are, and then one hot encodings for every type. So for example, the first three Pokemon are grass, because that's the Bulbasaur line of evolution. A Squirtle, which is, uh, no, sorry, the uh, Charmander then, which is fire. Uh, let's see, any more questions? Um, Yeah, uh, question in the chat to switch back to dark mode. Um, yeah, we just switched to light mode, so uh, people who saw a little bit less could follow it better. Uh, generally, I also like my dark mode, but let's stick to this one for now. Um, and yes, the other question by Lingo, uh, could not find TensorFlow Mac OS. I think you may need uh, to downgrade your Python for that one. Um, yeah, for so that... Uh, uh... Like, I guess it also depends uh, where you run it's on Windows. It also didn't work for me. Hmm. So I needed to replace it. Remember, if you're not on macOS, you need to replace it. Okay. Remove macOS part. Oh, yeah, right. Um, let's uh, continue for, uh, with this part for now. Um, so here we process the image data. Uh, so we copy over the image path because that's what we're training on. And now we have an image path. Uh, which you can see here in the process data as well. Uh, so for this specific example, it just copies over the data. It doesn't transform anything, but maybe you want to do some rescaling here or you want to remove the transparent backgrounds in a typical machine learning project. Uh, that's where you do that. And here we create a train test split. Um, so here you go. Uh, we've got 801 Pokemon in the data sets. Um, the images are 475 pixels by 475, and they've got four layers, uh, so RGB and the alpha layer, uh, because we are using transparent images. Um, and we take a look at the labels, um, and we are uh, interested in the type we're training for. So in our case, right now it's water, but we can change it later on to uh, start training for other Pokemon types. Great test splits. Um, so we've got 640 Pokemon in our training data set and 161 in our test data set. Um, and this is something you don't typically do in a notebook, but we are doing it now as an intermediary stage. Uh, so as I discussed earlier, if you um, uh, use your DAC, so we do the data pre-processing stage, then that generates a bunch of outputs. And those outputs are, again, inputs for the next stage. Uh, so this is where we save the uh, outputs of the pre-process stage as files. Uh, so uh, this is a bit lazy, but we're just using pickle dumps. Um, so we've got our uh, training data set, um, uh, X-train and uh, X-test, uh, and we've got our labels, I-train uh, and I-test. Uh, this is the part that may take a while because the files can get a bit large. Oh, for this one, it's fine. It's great. Uh, and here we're doing some stuff. So um, we are using a convolutional neural network for this. Um, this is where, where the data science magic happens. Um, this is where you do your experimenting. Um, for this one, prototype should work. It should give some sensical output. Um, so we continue and we can actually start training the model. 
this can take a while. Uh, also, depending on your platform, of course, um, it's fairly quick. I see lots of uh, good tech support going on in chat, so always happy to see that. Me, yeah, I'm still installing the requirements. No, it takes Ooh. a while. <laughs> Sorry, I should have uh, sent this homework uh, beforehand, maybe. Yeah. For the yeah, sake of recording, uh, something. Oh yeah, right, so. yeah. For the sake of the recording, we will slowly continue though. Um, so we did training, um, and here we can plot some graphs of training. Um, so yeah, this kind of graph that you may recognize from your own pro uh, projects, uh, and we will save the model. Um, in this case, I called it estimator, and we're again doing that as a pickle file. And then once we have the uh, model saved, we can start predicting for Pokemon. Um, so right here, um, we can see that Mudkip, it provides a score of 0.67, uh, that it is in fact a water Pokemon. And that's true because Mudkip is a water Pokemon. So yay, we're making progress. Um, now let's validate the um, entire model. Um, so this is again, uh, the first step of the validation stage or the evaluate stage where we load in the data again, uh, we load in the model. And then we can predict for all Pokemon. And once we have finished our prediction for every, each and every Pokemon, uh, we can calculate our metrics. Uh, so our accuracy is quite good actually, which uh, shouldn't be strange because there, there's a lot of clause imbalance. So your model could just say for every Pokemon is not a water Pokemon and would end up somewhere around here. Precision, not great. Recall is fine. Uh, our F1 score, um, I mean, I wouldn't put this model to production, but it's, uh, it's, it's a working example. Uh, and here's our confusion matrix. Um, so that's our prototype, right? That's where we haven't done anything with DC, uh, but we can go through a project and see how it works. Um, Let's see, pickle has a file limit size, I guess, for large file, so it might have problem pickling. Uh, yes, that's that could be an issue. I think you can bypass it with your settings. I didn't run into this issue myself, I'm afraid. Um, what psychopath uses pickle for data instead of uh, EG parquet? Uh, yeah, also a good question. Um, not the nicest formulation, I'm afraid, but um, it's it's easy to get this installed in your local environment. And generally it tends to work without too many issues. Again, use your own senses uh, when developing something for production. Um, let's get to the interesting part of the workshop. We've got our, um, our notebook in place and we can continue onwards. So this is where we start the actual workshop. We start implementing DVC. Um, by running through our work, Book, we created a bunch of uh, data. Uh, we created uh, pickle files for our uh, data sets or the, the train test split. Uh, we did our tra data transformation and created uh, uh, new images here. Um, we even have a notebook. Uh, we have an output. Uh, so we've got our model saved right here. Uh, we've got our plots that we saw in the, in the workbook earlier. Um, so we have all of that, and now we want to start first name here because maybe I, uh, from here on out, want to run an experiment with uh, an increased number of epochs, or um, I know we want to train for a dragon Pokemon. Uh, but at, as I do that in my notebook, uh, then all of these get overwritten, and I don't want that. Um, so now we start using DVC. Um, and DVC is, uh, Quite easy to get started. We already downloaded it in the previous step. Uh, let's try to do this a little bit nicer. And now we run DeepC in it or initialize. You can now commit the change to get. Um, so right now DeepC isn't doing anything yet. Uh, we still need to start tracking our data. Uh, and we start doing so with the external data set because uh, that's our input data. Uh, it's something we don't want to store in Git. And here we go. 
I, um, let's not worry about this for now, uh, but we have added the external data folder to DFC control. And what that has done is that all the files in external uh, are now no longer tracked by Git. And we can also see that because if we go to git ignore here, the entire external directory uh, is ignored by Git. Um, but we have created a external .dvc metadata file. Uh, it's got a hash for the directory. It's got the size, which is the combined size of all the files here. And it's got 906 files in them. So all of the Pokemon sprites and the uh, CSC. What else can we do? Um, we can take a look at get status to see what that has done. Uh, so we've created a number of uh, files in .dfc. Uh, so we've created the get ignore file, we've created our dfc config, um, which you can also take a look at. That's empty currently. Um, and from here on out, we can commit our changes to git. Um, it's going to be probably shouldn't have done git at all uh, because the notebook file is a bit large. Let's start it again. Um, yeah, let's uh, get at .dvc. Get commits. And now we can push them to our repository just like we could usually do. I should not have done that because we are still working on the main branch. That's um, very lousy of me. Uh, I'll fix that later on, but let's first do a git checkout to um, practice, to practice branch. And continue working from here. A uh, question from Dino. Uh, sorry, I jumped a bit late. Other than models, what other data artifacts being stored in Git? Uh, so anything that's not a text file generally. So your uh, your data sets, your models, uh, and in this case, also the training plots. Um, let's Probably continue. Probably you mean in because... DVC, right? Because oh, sorry, text yeah. stored in Git, but the rest is in DVC. Yeah, thanks for keeping me sharp. Uh, but yeah, that's indeed the case. Uh, so we have committed our initialization of DFC, and now we can uh, continue onwards. And we start by adding a remote uh, storage for our uh, DFC repository. So right now, if I were to delete the uh, DFC workshop directory uh, on my computer, then everything that we did would be lost. Uh, much like if you only have a Git repository, stuff will be lost when you delete it. You need to mirror it to somewhere online. Um, and at this point, the workshop starts to deviate a little bit for uh, those who use something different. Uh, but I figured that the easiest way to get started um, would be to use a Google Drive remote. Um, so let's take a look at that. Uh, here we go. I've created a remote. Um, there's already some data in there, um, but creating a Google Drive remote is fairly easy. Uh, we can create a folder. Uh, so let's call this one remote two. Uh, we go there. And uh, this is typically not something you want to do, but I don't want to get uh, bumped down in access control right now. Um, so the general access is going to be anyone with this link. And I even get to add it. Uh, again, please don't do this in a production environment, but if you want to do this uh, the proper way, then we need to set something up. So typically, you'll get an S3 bucket, maybe, or uh, uh, a bucket on any major cloud provider. You can also use uh, Google Drive. Um, that works well, but you need to create a, uh, a service account um, or a credentials file that Google, uh, that DVC can use to access this. Um, it's not that difficult, but uh, this is even easier. Um, so right now, we've got a fully accessible directory on Google Drive. Um, and we need the folder ID, which is this part. Um, if we go to, uh, let's take a look here. If we go to the docs for remote app, oh, I already opened that. Uh, we can see that uh, this is a command we need to run. 
And if we scroll down a little bit, uh, we get some information for all of the supported storage types. Um, so uh, again, you can use whatever you want. Um, also some self-hosted uh, solutions. Uh, for now, we will use Google Drive. And for that, we need to do deep sea remote app uh, dash D for making it default. So let's try all of that. Um, You see a remote app. Uh, it's going to be a Google Drive remote. And uh, we will need the, uh, where did I leave it? Here. We will need the URI that we just created. Do you not need to give it a name before the URL? Oh, yeah. Trial and error. Uh, G Drive remote. Or just Drive remote. Uh, and as you can see, uh, our drive remote has been set as our default. Okay, so can you we send the link for this, um, like the one you like this one, yeah. Yeah, I will. And maybe send it to chat because I think uh, spam filters will not let you publish links in the live chat. So send it to Zoom chat, and then uh, I will post them in oh, the live chat. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's see where is my chat. You, okay, I'll find it. it. No, don't worry. I'll just Google it. There you go. Ah, you found it. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I don't typically use Zoom all that much. So it's a bit figuring out for me. Uh, but now that we've got a remote edit, we can use DFC push just like you would use Git push. So let's get that again. Error. G drive is not supported. Oh, that's annoying. Um, so uh, I actually did do this, but I need to restart the virtual environment. So uh, depending on the remote you want to use, you need to specify in your requirements which remote you want to use. So the example includes all remotes, uh, which is typically more than you would need in your project. Um, but for now, we need the G drive one. Let's give the DC push another go. And there we go. Not exactly sure why this happens, but restarting the VM works. And as you can see right now, uh, we are transferring all of the documents uh, to our remote. Uh, so just like we have our cache, um, which includes all of these files, um, we also have uh, that cache shortly on Google Drive. And we can uh, showcase that by going to our remote. As you can see, the files are being created, refers to the directories, and we've got our image files right here. Now, as you will see, the image files don't make any sense whatsoever. And don't need, yeah, don't worry about that. That's the part that DFC handles. Um, so it uses the hashes to see whether files have changed. Uh, so for example, if I start drawing on Pikachu, uh, then the image file will change uh, and it will get a new hash. And that's how DFC knows how to version your, uh, your files properly. Um, Anything else? Okay, nothing in the chat thus far. So let's continue. The DFC push is uh, slowly processing, uh, may depend on your internet speed, uh, but we can continue uh, in the meantime. I should probably quit Google Chrome because I keep opening it um, by accident. Um, we are now versioning our data sets with, uh, uh, or sorry, our, yeah, our data sets and our models with DFC. Uh, so if we do our model training again, and we do a git commit, and we do uh, also a DFC push, then our new model training is, is saved on the remote. And we can go back to the one we are uploading now um, and uh, reproduce that experiment that we just did. But we still don't have a pipeline. Uh, and we still need to go into the notebook to run through all the cells. Uh, and that's a bit of a hassle, which we don't want. Um, so. This is where the pipeline creation process starts. And first of all, we're going to create a params.yaml file. Uh, and DFC is going to read the parameters from this YAML file uh, to determine uh, which parameters to put into our machine learning experiment. So here we go, params.yaml. And as you can see, uh, these are the same uh, parameters, maybe slightly different names, as we had in the um, uh, the notebook earlier. So again, we can do a git commit. 
Um, right, yeah, T uh, data and outputs aren't yet tracked by DFC. I lied earlier, uh, we are only tracking the input data and there's good reason for that, but we'll get to that later. Um, so what did we change? Uh, we created a branch like YAML file and we do wanna um, add that to our git commit history. Git commits, create branch.yaml. Okay, we have our Ramstack.yaml in place. And this is where we start breaking up the, um, the notebook. Um, so as we discussed earlier, we've got four distinct stages, each with their own outputs, uh, the outputs of which are an input for the next stage. And we are going to break them up into Python modules. Um, so we're gonna have four stages, data pre-process, data load, train, and evaluate. Um, and for the sake of time, uh, I will, um, copy over the stuff I did before this. Typically what the process will look is you will just go into your notebook, uh, copy the relevant parts and put them in a Python module. And then we need some boilerplate around it uh, to make it work as magic. Um, so if we go here, uh, you can't see this and that's fine. Um, where are we? SRC, there we go. So we create a SRC folder, which is typically where your Python modules are created. Um, we are going to create a utils, uh, which is a bit of boilerplate that helps in this project. Uh, sorry, this should be a directory, of course. Um, and in utils, we are going to create finds projects roots .py. This is also uh, a cell in the Workbook or in a notebook. And then we, in the regular SRC folder, we are going to create a uh, data pre process stage. And we are going to create a um, let's copy that. Um, we are going to create a data load stage. We are going to create a, a training stage, a training module, and we are going to create a test. Uh, no, sorry, let's call that evaluates because that's what I'm using uh, in the other ones as well. Um, then from our notebook, um, as I described, you go there, getting a little bit clutter on the screen. But for example, for data pre-processing, this is stuff we're interested in copying over. Um, and I've already done that somewhere else. Um, and the, this is the highly um, varying part depending on the prototype you're actually working on. Um, so also in the, uh, the descriptions for the workshop or the instructions, you'll find a link uh, to the solutions um it's probably easy to copy them over at least for now uh but we will discuss what exactly is going on um, it's in a different branch or where to find the solution uh it's in the solution branch yeah in the solution branch okay um so first the data pre-process uh i'm going to zoom out a little bit sorry just to get better idea we still have our imports that we need to do uh this is the util we just created so that it's always working in the same directory um, this is what we copied over. And then all the way at the bottom, uh, we've got our main function. And the main function is what is triggered when we run the Python module from our command line. Um, we do some argument parsing. This is just copy paste boilerplate. Here we import our parameters. Um, so the params like YAML. And here we set our, um, uh, our variable, uh, the variables that we need, depending on the contents of our params like YAML. Uh, and once we've got all of that in place, we can start running the functions we defined above. So if we train it, uh, save this. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, this is also described here. Then you can use this command um, to run the Python module. Um, so if we go to our terminal, 
we use Python 3, um, SRC, uh, data reprocess, and params is in params.yaml. Ah, uh, no module named pandas. Import pandas as pd. Was that you not included not in the... Because you don't... Uh, your oh, sorry, yeah. Ah, it's probably another having... terminal, right? Yes, I love having tech support uh, right on the line. Um, that's why you should use Pipan. <laughs> very sharp, yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's my learning out of this workshop. Um, manage my virtual environments better. Um, I'd be happy to uh, uh, to see the link pop up right now, Alexi, in the recording. Um, uh, so we've got our source and we can try this again. Uh, so now, fingers crossed, live demos. Yes, there you go. Um, these are the outputs as we got them, but now we're getting them in a terminal. And we can do this for each of the stages. Uh, so we already did data reprocess. Um, now let's copy over the data loads. Um, and again, um, we create a main function. We do this, we repeat the same boilerplate. Uh, we need some other variables here. Um, so these are done here. And also we need some of the outputs that we uh, wrote in the previous stage. Um, oh no, sorry, that's, uh, that's only in the next stage. So here we are pickle dumping um, the stuff that uh, is our outputs. Uh, if we then go to train, which I will also copy over, um, the same stuff is going on here, uh, but now we have pickle loads for our outputs from the previous step. And then there's the final stage we need to do, which is evaluate. Um, and there we go. Um, and again, we copy over the stuff from our notebooks. Uh, here, most of the, uh, the action happens in the main function. So we load, our uh, load the outputs of the previous stages that we need. Uh, we do a model prediction. Um, we create metrics, and then we save those metrics as a metrics YAML file. Um, and we print them as well to our terminal. Right, so let's save all of these. We'll close them. And now we can run each model from our command line, which is a little bit better than going into the notebook to run the cells one after the other. Uh, but still, uh, we want to do this in one subsequent uh, um, manner. So we want to be able to run the entire pipeline with one command. And at this point, you may ask, okay, I can just write a script that uh, runs those commands after one another. Um, but it's a little bit easier to do this with DC. Mm or rather a little bit quicker uh, because DVC uh, caches your outputs for each stage. Um, so for example, if our data set doesn't change um, throughout various experiments, then we don't need to run the data loading and the data pre-processing stage each and every time. Uh, so if we add, I don't know, uh, an extra layer to our training, um, training our model, then we uh, only need to run uh, the last two steps of our uh, DAG of our pipeline. And that's why we use DVC because it can speed up your uh, your development by caching the outputs. Let's take a quick look at the chat. Are there any uh, more questions? The copy and paste seems error prone. Uh, yes, that is indeed error prone. There are some tools that allow for automatic transforming uh, or automatic transformation of the, uh, of the notebook. Um, I've also written a blog post, which I think was linked in the, uh, um, uh, the description of the event or the invitation, uh, where we read the entire notebook, um, and run it as one, but that doesn't provide you the benefits of caching the outputs. Sorry, you, you want to jump in? Yeah. yeah, you still need to, like, if you have one big notebook, it's still a lot of manual work to decompose it into multiple, uh, modules, right? Uh, yes, and I don't know, correct. like, if there is any automatic way to do this. Uh, at the end, it's still like a developer or a data scientist, a mach machine learning engineer, whoever, who needs to do that, right? Yeah, I also it, uh, I already see a suggestion popping up in chat. Uh, so MB Dev, uh, yes, I haven't used that myself, so I can't really. Do what is correct? 
Yeah, I'll look it up. Well, what I typically do is I use um, this command that comes with Jupyter called NB convert, and you do Jupyter NB convert to script, and then it just takes your IPB file and turns it into, into Python script, and then you just copy paste different things. Eventually, essentially, it's what you did, but uh, then you have it already in a Python script. Yeah, uh, probably the nicer way to do this. Uh, so my this workshop will have been a success for me if uh, at this point I am uh, actively convincing you not to get to the point where you've got this huge notebook going on. Um, so if at a certain point you think, hey, this is getting a bit bloated, um, maybe transfer, uh, transform this into a deep sea pipeline, then uh, I'll be happy about this. Uh, because probably, the, as I said all the way at the beginning of this workshop, um, notebooks are great for prototyping, but at a certain point you need to realize, oh, this is growing beyond uh, just prototyping, I need to actively experiment. Um, and that's probably where you want to start worrying about this stuff. Um, I think and from there on out. Uh, and BDEV is like a replacement for, like, you know, there are people who like running notebooks in production. We actually also do this uh, at the company where I work. Um, yeah. yeah, there are tools for that. And I think and BDEV is one of such tools. But I guess DVC does not play it nice with no. these things yeah. right. no because yeah for notebooks it's it's um so every time you run a notebook it's, it contains metadata um that gets updated so versioning notebooks is uh is a bit of a hassle and there are tools to strip those metadata uh, and make it more reproducible but yeah the the dfc way is to define your pipeline as code um and yeah uh know what's going on so that you can you can version everything for either git or dfc um, so yeah, let's let's move beyond uh, um, using notebooks. Uh, actually, we we could just uh, delete those if we were so inclined, and let's start using the modules we created. Um, so if we go back to our uh, instructions, we start creating the pipeline, um, and this is what your typical pipeline looks like. Uh, pipeline is uh, defined in DVC.yaml. Um, so we create the DVC.yaml. And then we need to define our dependencies, our outputs, uh, the params that we pass to it, and we do that for every stage. Um, so again, I have already done this, which is also linked here. Um, so this is what it will look like. Um, let's copy it over, and then we can quickly go through it. Um, boom, boom. New file, dc.yaml. So we've got our stages. The first data pre-processing, then data loading, etc. For each stage, we execute a command, uh, which is exactly the same as we would execute it from our uh, uh, terminal. And uh, in order to execute the stage, we have a number of dependencies. So for the data pre-processing stage, um, that's the existence of data pre-processed.py. So we actually want the module to exist. We also want our external data to exist. So the images and the uh, CSV with labels. Then we know that our module is going to create a number of outputs. And there's going to be data processed, both more C, uh, CSV, uh, another CSV with image pass. Probably should have structured this a little bit differently, but that's fine. Um, and then our uh, processed image files. Uh, and in order to execute this command, we need our uh, a number of parameters from our parameters.yaml. Um, and those are the base section. Uh, so let's take a look uh, at browser YAML. So the base um, and uh, everything we need in data pre-process. So uh, we are constructing a label for water here. So we need to um, know that parameter and then uh, this stuff. Uh, so these are our uh, file paths. So the DPC knows where to find the, uh, or sorry, rather Python in this case, uh, knows where to find uh, the data that we need. Um, yes, okay. Um, then we do that for every step. Uh, for the next step, rather than only having dependence uh, outputs, we also have the dependencies from the previous step. Uh, so as you can see here, the data processed occurs as an output in this stage and as a dependency in, this, uh, in the next one. And through this, you can create quite extensive DAGs, like the one uh, we're using right now is just a straight line four stages subsequently, but 
at a certain point, you may get to uh, to a project where you can execute two stages uh, separately from another, um, and then they can both be dependent on uh, the stage above it, um, and a stage below them can be dependent on both of those. And this is how you manage that. We pass some other parameters, um, and we do this for every uh, each one of the stages. And then this is uh, a little bit different. Uh, for the evaluation, we create a metrics output, and a metrics output is uh, a YAML file in this case. We were already generating this uh, in the notebook, but we are um, now uh, explicitly saying that this is a metrics file. Um, and we do that so that we can uh, compare experiments with DVC from the command line. Um, so one of the metrics, for example, is F1. Um, and if we specify that uh, metrics.yaml is in fact a metrics file, uh, DVC will let us compare those F1 scores across different experiments. So we've got a pipeline to find S code here. Um, let's see, we don't need to keep opening new terminals, but let's put it to the test. Um, how do we reproduce our pipeline? Nothing has changed, um, but we can run through it. Oh, wait, sorry. Actually, let's do one other thing, DVC DAG. Um, so this is the DAG visually that DVC constructs from your uh, uh, DVC.yaml file. Um, now let's do DVC reproduce. Uh, and it's gonna run through all of those stages. Uh, DVC isn't aware that we've run uh, the uh, stage individually yet. So it's gonna run through them one by one. Um, and it's gonna take a little while. So let's see if there are any other questions right now. I don't think so, unless I'm overlooking something. There were, but I took care of them. Oh, nice. So there was, maybe for those who watch it in replay, um, all these files that uh, Rob created, they are available in the solution branch. So go to the link that is in the description, then switch to a different branch, and then you can get all the files from there. Uh, yeah, you we can actually just show this. Works. Yeah. So we've got main here, go to solution. And there we've and got then, all, all, everything already set up. Yeah, and then another question was, uh, uh, or more more like a comment about a tool called Linear Pi, which is a thing like it's not related to DVC in any way, but that's another tool that you can use for transforming um, notebooks in uh, in pipelines. Cool. I'll need to uh, look up that one as well. Then. Yeah. I've got a lot of homework out of this uh, this workshop. <laughs> Yeah, thanks a lot for bringing this all all these things up. The other one was NBDEF, right? Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah. Finished. There we go. Evaluation done. Accuracy even better than it used to be. Um, so that's our pipeline. And now we can go through it with DC reproduce. Um, but as you will see here, we've also got another way of running experiments. Um, so first of all, what we could do now is start running experiments by going to our params.yaml um, and saying, okay, and for the next Pokemon version for Pokemon uh, Scarlet, I'm not interested in becoming a water trainer, but I want to be a bug catcher. Um, so let's change this to bug. And then if we do DVC repro again, uh, it will see that uh, our parameters have changed um, so that we do in fact want to rerun a number of stages. Um, do we go now? Nah, let's not go through all of this again. Uh, this is not the best way to do this. Um, sorry, let's, let's also show one in the later stages. So what, for example, um, if we do a different train no, let's do a different learning rate. Before you um, do this, uh, I'm just wondering if we should commit the results of the previous run, so then we kind of see the changes in the uh, in the matrix. Um, no, let's not do that yet. Um, okay. Sorry, I, I cut off the... Um, Getting a bit ahead? Yeah. Uh, because 
ideally, I, I wouldn't recommend using uh, this way to run experiments. Yeah. Uh, so instead, um, no, let's, let's try this one. As you can see, now I only uh, changed something in the train set. Uh, so DVC knows that uh, preprocess hasn't changed uh, and also that data load uh, is cached. Uh, so we can just skip those and go straight towards training the model. Um, let's wrap this one, uh, one up uh, because it's uh, going quite quickly. Um, and then meanwhile, we can look at the other way, which I think is the, the recommended way of doing so, uh, or it is recommended way of doing so, and the way I think you should be doing so. And that's by running experiments. So we can trigger a new experiment, not by going into the parameters and changing something manually, but by using DVC EXP run. And then with the S uh, option, capital S, we can set a parameter. Uh, so for example, this uh, experiment would uh, run the entire pipeline, but for uh, uh, becoming a dragon type trainer. Um, so let's try that one as well. And at this point, we get uh, different experiments. So we've got a workspace, which is currently a uh, water type trainer, the, the previous run we did uh, with an incre uh, increased learning rate. Uh, and we are now doing other experiments. Uh, becoming dragon type trainer with otherwise the same parameters. Um, and the way DVC experiments work, uh, they can create a branch that don't necessarily have to create a branch. So you can uh, mess around, figure, uh, try different experiments. And uh, as I will show shortly, we can then compare those experiments, pick the best one, and promote those two in branch um, in our Git commit history. Let's take a quick breather as this runs again. Yeah, well, if, since we're, oh, it finished. I was going yeah. to ask you about one of the questions, if you have any experience with deploying PyTorch models. Because I kind of sent the person who asked that to Datadocs Club Slack. Um, yeah. But I don't know, do you have any experience with PyTorch? Uh, not myself, no, I'm afraid. Uh, I know <laughs> I, I don't want to toot uh, iterators yeah. more too much, but um, yeah. take a look at MLM, uh, M-L-E-M dot A-I, um, because that, that is a package also free and open source that makes it easier to deploy your models uh, to production. Just send it to live chat. Yeah. Um, okay, so now we can compare those experiments because we've just uh, run two of them and we can do so with DC EXP show. And this will generate a um, model. So we've got our, um, our workspace and we've got the experiment we just ran. Uh, and currently, our workspace is also the experiment. Sorry, you, you were right. Uh, uh, I should have uh, committed the other one earlier. Um, let's do another one for water. Uh, and in the meantime, I would like to point all of you, because uh, thus far we've been working in, um, oh, this one was cache, so that's nice. Uh, in the meantime, we've been working with um, our terminal thus far. Uh, so here we've got our experiments overview. Um, and these two experiments have different outcomes. But what works a little bit better, um, uh, here you can see one for water, one for dragon. What works better, or at least what I prefer using, um, is the DC extension for VS Code, um, which contains, it's, it's a visual uh, approach to what we've been doing thus far. But here we can um, compare our experiments visually. Um, so we've got our two experiments here um, and previous commits if we want to look at them. Um, honestly, that, oh, I, hadn't, I wasn't even aware that this has been released yet, uh, but we can also define our pipelines from here, apparently. 
uh, you can connect to Studio. The SaaS offering for interactive. Let's not get into that too much. Uh, to install it, we just go to the extensions uh, tab and then type DVC. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, how do you get there? Uh, go to the extensions tab, DVC, okay. and you can install it here. Can you go full screen with uh, VS Code? Yes, yeah. of course. Sorry. A bit more space. Uh, a question I see hyperparams hard coded in the params.yaml. Uh, oh, I think that should be DVC, maybe. That's Python probably DVC, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, uh, exactly the, um, the hyperparams are hard coded here. Um, but if we run an experiment, then it um, updates those uh, parameters in this file. So then if we go to our git commit history, um, we can take a look at different commits uh, and see, um, if you go to solution, we can take a look at different commits and then see what those parameters were at a given point in time. Uh, so, for example, for the current commit uh, in our solutions, if we go to params.yaml, we can see that our test size was 0.2 and our uh, batch size was 120. Now, if we change these in a different experiment, um, actually, let's let's show that. Um, so, let's see what we have got. Um, so this should all be good to uh, add. Let's let's remove the notebooks because we don't really need those anymore. Um, get add dash, get commit, uh, experiments. Uh, uh, what were we training this one? Uh, increase learning rates. Get push and I'll get an error. Okay. Probably also didn't want to push the models, but I guess it's. Um, yeah, so the models. Um... Like, weren't they supposed to be picked up by DVC? Yeah, no. the models aren't being pushed to get. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, good, good that you mentioned that. Um, because only the text files uh, are being pushed there, uh, or at least they should be. It's going to be a bit of a uh, slip up if I mess this one up. Um, but the model is uh, defined as a uh, an output. Uh, so the save model is uh, automatically tracked by DVC. You don't need to edit to DVC control. If it's an output uh, in a DVC pipeline, then it is added to DVC. And mm -hmm. so if we now do DVC push, which I want to do because it's going to take a while, it will push the um, the model file to our DVC remote. So does it automatically add it to git ignore when you do git add dot? It yes. knows that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it knows um, that it should be ignored and not added. Yeah. Every file is either tracked by DFC or by Git, or so primarily by Git and otherwise by DFC. If you tell DFC to track it, and if you tell DFC to track it, either it's through using DFC add or by adding it as a uh, cached pipeline output, uh, then DFC automatically adds it to your git ignore. That's smart. Um, so then uh, we can take a look here. Uh, so as we discussed earlier, um, we now know for this commit in this specific branch, what our hyperparameters were. And then if we go to branches, there should now be a practice branch, the one we've been working on. Um, then we can now see in this given com uh, commit uh, that we have been experimenting with our learning rates. I think that's one we updated anyway. I said it was this one. Um, I think the question, maybe I misunderstood it, but I think the question was when you do it through the command line interface, when you change, uh, because I remember you could also change the parameter there, right? You can specify the parameter. Will it also update the YAML file? Yeah, it will. Uh -huh. um, actually, we can uh, we can show that. Um, where are we? Let's close this terminal. So right now, our, uh, we were experimenting with water Pokemon. So if we go to browse the camel, we will see water here. Um, and let's go for, I don't know, ice Pokemon. Let's freeze them over. 
uh, done here. Deep sea whale. Wow, magic. Thanks for the channel. Whoa. Magic code. Um, so if we take a look at our tutorial again, um, then that leaves us at the end of our module one for the workshop. We have now transformed our entire pipeline into a reproducible DFC pipeline where all files are either tracked uh, and versioned by Git or by DFC. And we can easily run experiments, compare their outcomes and promote um, uh, experiments uh, to a feature branch in uh, in Git, in our Git repository. Um, so I would recommend uh, exploring the DFC extension for Visual Studio, uh, maybe yourself. Uh, it's It's got the same principles or it's, it's the same inner mechanics, uh, but uh, through a nicer interface, which may make it a little bit more approachable uh, if you want to use this. Uh, and I think uh, Alex also showed this in the previous uh, 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 guides, right? Or workshop. Yeah, there was a workshop from Alex Kim about, uh, what's the name? Uh, I'll look it up right now and uh, we'll yeah, put the let's link. link it in the, in the description. Um, so let's take a look at the time. We are running a bit short, which is what I was afraid of, I must admit. Um, but this workshop, can, or, sorry, the pipeline can also be taken online. Um, so I don't know, Alexi, if we can't wrap this up uh, in the 12 ish minutes that we have remaining. Um, uh, if it takes a bit longer, if you can stay longer, I don't know. Uh, that's fine. Okay, let's. Um, uh, let's try the basics first, and then um, uh, the advanced stuff um, can be found in the in the workshop description because that's going to take some uh, configuring for AWS or GCP as well. Um, so in that case, I just want to show uh, how to create a workflow YAML file and use that YAML file to trigger uh, scripts, which can also be our DFC pipeline from our um, uh, GitHub actions. Um, so if you still need to do so, you can go to settings here, then uh, on the left hand side, you've got actions, general, uh, and then you need to enable workflows here. Uh, for me, they're already uh, enabled in this, um, uh, in this repository. Um, and as we can see in the descriptions, we can then create a workflow. Um, let's close all of this. That's a bit too much. So, so this is uh, our, um, uh, our file structure again. Uh, and we can create GitHub here. Oh, sorry, it shouldn't go in SRC, that should go to the root. Um, and then we should create a workflows directory there. Uh, and this is specifically to GitHub, but uh, uh, similar uh, workflows can be found in GitLab or in Bitbuckets. Um, they are names a bit different. Uh, this should be a file, I'm sorry. It should be a directory. Um, and then let's copy this boilerplate example. So uh, GitHub allows you to define actions for your CSD uh, as YAML. Um, so we will not use push here, we will just use workflow dispatch, uh, but there are triggers that you can use. So for example, if you use push, then every time you push uh, changes to your repository on GitHub, uh, the pipeline will automatically trigger. Workflow dispatch is uh, manually. So that's button like, hey, I wanna run this pipeline. Um, and we define a, a job there. A job, just like any pipeline, uh, consists of a uh, sequence of stages. Uh, for now, we're just going to do train and report. Uh, and it's going to run on Ubuntu. Uh, it's going to have a DFC base. Um, and uh, here you can define which commands it executes. Um, so for, for just the basic example, it's not actually going to do anything. Uh, it's just going to uh, provide some textual feedback. Uh, and then uh, I 
added a link. I put the link to the previous workshop we had with Alex, uh, where okay. he shows uh, like how to use DVC, CML, and other things, and this uh, DVC extension. So the link is in the live chat and in the description, and there you can see, um, I guess, more advanced example of CML. Yeah, nice. Uh, so create a basic workflow. And we push that to get as well. Uh, we push that to GitHub, I should say. And now if you go to the workshop and we go to practice, then we can take a look at actions. And we will see that we have created, um, am I in the right branch? Doesn't look distinguish here between. Oh no, actually I think that's uh, correct. Oh, that's interesting. Um, what's going on here? Okay, let's, um, I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong. Let's not worry about this. This is what you should, uh, should see when you uh, push this. Uh, so you can go to the workflow file, which is the same as we just uh, implemented. Um, and it's gonna do something. And uh, GitHub provides free runners that you can use to run your stuff. Uh, that being said, they do have some hardware limitations. So if you are doing any serious um, um, model training, you probably do want to do so on proficient hardware. And that's where CML comes in because it makes it very easy to do that. This is the sort of output that you should see. Um, it's executing commands and you're getting something back. Um, just like you can use something, uh, you can use uh, your terminal to run something locally, you can um, use this approach to run stuff on GitHub hardware. Um, and we can expand upon the echo uh, command uh, to run more file stuff, such as DVC reproduce or DVC exp run. Um, and that's where it gets interesting. Uh, I won't demo this live, but I will show you what it should look like roughly. Um, after you do some configuration, um, because if we go to solution, I've created a example workflow uh, that does something more. Um, so let's walk through this quickly. Uh, we again use workflow dispatch so that we can trigger this workflow whenever we want to with push of button. We can also do it with push whenever we push code changes. And there's a whole list of triggers that you can use to uh, start your workflow. You could also schedule your model training. Uh, so um, a use case that's quite interesting, I think, is if you want to do redo your model training periodically, uh, you can create a workflow that pulls in your data, uh, your latest data, um, do your model training, and create a new branch um, to see if you um, if your model is still performing well, and compare it against um, previous model runs. Um, so uh, with CML, we can um, uh, CML allows us to tailor this specifically to machine learning workflows. Um, so we're doing a pipeline in two stages. Uh, first, we're deploying a runner, and then we're training our model. Um, and let's take a look at the train model first, counterintuitively. Um, what we're doing here is we uh, are setting up our, uh, our model training. We are providing some credentials. Um, so these are the credentials that are needed to access the um, the DVC remote I created earlier uh, on Google Drive, this one. Uh, and for that, you'll need to uh, set up a um, uh, service account. Um, similarly, if you're using, for example, an S3 bucket, uh, you will need to provide your credentials uh, or you will need to generate credentials and provide them in your GitHub secrets um, so that DVC can access the data. Uh, once you've got it all set up, uh, you can run scripts just as you could run them from your terminal. Um, so you can, on the runner, install your requirements. You can pull your data there. You can reproduce the pipeline. You can push the results back to the remote. And then CML allows you to create a pull request um, that displays visually uh, the performance of your, um, of your machine learning experiment. So for example, you could create a pull request that automatically generates, uh, has an automatically generated confusion metrics in it, uh, your metrics, and then through commits, uh, you can compare which uh, model training is performing better uh, and decide which one to keep, for example. 
Um, now, why do we do that on different hardware? What CML allows you to do is uh, deploy a runner um, quite easily. So you provide your access credentials. In this case, I chose AWS here because that's what we use with Edge um, You need an access key ID and a secret. Um, all of those are um, added in your um, secrets over here for actions. So right now it's not working because it didn't add those secrets. The personal access token is here and GitHub uh, will automatically paste in the values for those um, for those secrets. And then CML allows us to provision a runner uh, on which we will execute um, our training uh, uh, stage. So rather than using GitHub Actions itself or the runner that GitHub provides, we are creating our own. Uh, and we are going to do so uh, on an AWS machine uh, located in Western Europe. Uh, we can define our cloud type um, and it's going to be single use. So right after model training, we just throw it out. Uh, we don't want to see the runner again. Uh, and that's going to reduce your cloud expenditure because your uh, cloud instances don't keep running all the time. Now, I realize that all of this is a bit much uh, to fly through. Um, so in the workshop description, you can find some more materials uh, to go about this. Um, oh, I didn't update this part. I will put some uh, some materials here. Uh, alternatively, you can go to iterative uh, AI uh, to our blog um, and take a look at CML. Uh, oh, and this is the one. Uh, this is a blog post I wrote that takes you through this process. Uh, and it uh, teaches you, or it's a guide to uh, let you do model training, um, create a pull requ uh, request whenever you do your model training. And also in part two of this, uh, make sure that the model is safe to your DC repository. Please send the link to Zoom chat. Yes, um, let's do this straight away. And then uh, again, so also, uh, like he, after checking this blog post, um, you can check the workshop from Alex, uh, where he also yeah. shows how to use CML. Yeah, I'm going to put it now to the description. Ah, oh, there are two links. Yeah, it's a two part blog post. Um, so let's see. Uh, question from Shamina. Can we automatically retrain model if inputs data changes in some way? Uh, yes. Um, so DVC's DAG is, uh, and, and cache is file based. Uh, so it calculates a hash for every file. So uh, DVC will only, um, like it's, it's all or nothing. So if anything changed in your input data and you do model training, then it will detect that your input data uh, changed. So it will run the entire pipeline. Uh, model distributions um, is a little bit more difficult. I think there are other tools uh, that you could probably combine DFC with to achieve that. Uh, ways or commands to retrieve are different specific models, uh, which are very Sorry, oh. like I'm, I'm just wanted to add to your previous point like isn't it what cml is for like you change something you push and then like will it not detect that uh, there are some changes and they retrain the model uh yes um but uh, um like i can imagine that you have a database somewhere and you um anytime your distribution in your database changes then you want to retrain your model Oh, what you could right. do with CML is run a periodic check, like, oh, every week I want to see what mm -hmm. what has happened with my input data mm -hmm. um, and, and take it from there. Uh, you could yes, probably so also build some checks here, there. Here you need a system that detects drift, right? And then yeah, exactly. invokes DVC. Yeah. Um, so ways to or commands to retrieve are different specific models, which are first using DVC. That's a really good question, which I'd still like to answer. Um, so let's close this. So conceptually, um, our, um, our experiment is now tied to a git commit. Um, so uh, here we've got a given experiment name, F27 something, uh, and that contains a certain version for every, uh, for the code, for the data, for the parameters and our outputs. Um, 
So if we want to change our model that is currently in our workspace, all we need to do is do git checkout to a different commit, um, which can be in a different branch or in the same branch. Just do git checkout and then use DVC checkout and DVC will um, uh, restore from its cache uh, the model, the parameters, or sorry, not the parameters, uh, the data um, to uh, your workspace. Um, and what we can also do uh, is if your colleague or a coworker or a teammate has, has done that and he, uh, they have pushed the, um, the commits uh, or the experiments uh, to GitHub and to the DFC remote, uh, then you can pull the data from there uh, with DFC pool. I hope I'm that wondering that if point. there is a way to, um, like when you do Git checkout, you might accidentally yes. forget to do DVC checkout, right? Yeah, you can uh, configure a DVC to do that automatically. Okay. Uh, you mean like when you do Git checkout, you would uh, like it would yeah. automatically? Uh -huh. Exactly. Yeah, that's cool. Cool. I think um, it's, it's sort of on time. Uh, we mm -hmm. didn't get to cover everything. Um, yeah, CML is a little bit more involved because you, it's it's really, it's, for what it does, it's really easy to get started, um, but you will still need to set up your cloud environment, generate some credentials, add them as secrets. Uh, so it's difficult to um, to work that into a workshop. Uh, but I hope the, uh, the instructions provide a starting point to uh, get going with that. Well, the most important part we did cover, right? And now yeah. knowing how the knowing the basics of DVC, like it's possible to um, put it to CML and experiment with this. Uh, let's see. I don't see any further questions in chat. Yeah, so. I don't know. So. Should, does it mean we should uh, conclude? Because uh, we're a bit over time. So I wanted I to thank so. you. That's a great workshop. Thanks also everyone for joining us, for being active, for um, for asking questions. Uh, Rob, do you want to say anything before we finish? <laughs> yeah, you're fishing for uh, for what I want to say. <laughs> uh, yeah, so sadly I was laid off by Etrus last week. Um, so I'm looking for a job in DevRel. Uh, preferably with with data science, uh, I'm a lot stuck on space. I really enjoyed doing what I did, um, but yeah, uh, it is what it is. Working on a startup, so should you have any leads, uh, please let me know. Uh, I'd be uh, be happy to uh, to receive those. And of course, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn, uh, send me a message. Uh, just also if you want to connect and uh, uh, stay in touch. Yeah, that was a great workshop. So you would be missing out if you don't reach out to Rob. Thanks, because you might have. It to have uh, a devil like him on your team. Yeah, still available. Can yeah. all stop. So I will also put your LinkedIn uh, in the links. Yeah, and that would be great. Yeah. Great workshop. Thanks again. And uh, yeah, well, I don't know what else to say. Just uh, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks see, you yeah. <laughs> see you next time. Yeah, see you next time. Okay. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>